uh, in recent days I read from two different Ajahnanam talks and I read about half of those talks and today I'm going to read a little more of both of those talks. There's the one talk where Tanajan is talking about his, in a way, culmination of his insight practice where the path factors have become very powerful and where he was practicing very hard. And the other day we read to the point where he described himself that his mind had entered a different stream of knowing, undiluted knowing, and uh, that the mind had changed irreversibly. So we're reading a little more of that talk, the next stages of development for Tanajan. And then rather than read all of the remainder of that talk, I'd like to then read a little of the talk which Tanajan gave at Wat Nompopong, which is more about general practice very good instruction for sincere practitioners teaching a retreat trying to get a balance of what is helping us to see where practice goes and also what is practical for us now one meditator said reading about how sincere Arjuna Nan was practicing when he had his insight was uh, actually a little intimidating a sense of of how hard it uh, seems to really attain to an unshakable insight. As the talk progresses, what's interesting to notice is Arjuna Nan explains that from that point, the energy and the motivation to practice was much easier. The practice was carrying itself because having experienced such bliss and such confirmation of faith and such clear insight, the energy to put an end to greed, hatred and delusion was was there. And so that's also optimistic, isn't it, that I suspect this uh, attaining to the stream entry stage is probably the most difficult because uh, from that point on there is unshakable faith. One has seen the goal, so it, there's a lot of resources unshakable faith and uh, clear insight. Arjuna Nan actually explains it, that at the point of entering the stream is actually where most of the kilesas leave the mind. It's like they get exploded out of the mind. But obviously we've made a lot of karma with greed, hatred and delusion and they don't want to leave. So attaining that level of insight does require quite a bit of momentum, usually depending on how much practice we've practiced in the past lives also. But usually to get to that point, from certainly from the biographies I've read of the uh, masters of the last century in Thailand, it was not easy to accomplish that. But as Ajahn Anam says, he often says in his Dhamma talks that we aspire to entering the stream and we hope to do it this lifetime and we even be optimistic it's possible. He always says it's possible. But at the same time, we can't control it and we can't expect it either. We can be optimistic and we can lay the causes. So basically, we just get on with doing our breath meditation and our buddho, maintaining our awareness in all postures, cultivating the metta, maintaining mindfulness, awareness of death, and then particularly the body contemplation. And then... Uh, Arjuna Nan is constantly affirming that path and fruit is getting closer. The more we practice, it's getting closer. So we don't know exactly when it will be, but the more we practice, it's coming closer all the time. I also mentioned the other day there's a bit of a risk when one reads the accounts of how the Kubrajans attained, and there's a risk when they themselves reveal their process because inevitably some people believe them and some people don't and I think they have to weigh the benefits and the drawbacks because when Ajahn Mahabua who is a very respected master talked about his final attainment those who had faith in him were so grateful that he shared 
the details of the experience and their faith was deeper. But there was a percentage among Thai Buddhists who felt that real enlightened people don't reveal their insights and some people lost faith. But what the Buddha said, you know, when he was still alive, he said, the teachings will become corrupted people won't understand them correctly and they'll teach them incorrectly. So the further we get away from the life of the Buddha, there are false dhammas or dhammas which are incomplete. And so these masters have to make the decision, do they reveal in a personal way their insights and what they believe they've attained, understanding that some people will believe them and some won't. Because those that believe them derive benefit but those that don't actually make obstructive karma. If someone really is enlightened and you decide that you think they're not, that's very harmful. With this particular group of people here, Malaysian Buddhists mostly, a few Thais, some Sri Lankans from Australia, Peter, a one Caucasian. But the group here, most of you being probably faith types and most of you knowing me, for a few years, if if I say I live with Ajahn Anand for a few years, had many conversations with him, I believe what he's saying is true, most of you will think, well, me too. <laughs> so this is a, a safe context to, to talk about this with confidence. And uh, perhaps in the West one has to be more careful when people have more conceptual understanding but they're less faithy, less quick to believe, and uh, more critical, basically. I just want to mention that the talk that Tanajan gave at Wapapong, which has the very practical instructions, I was present at that talk, and uh, I've listened to the talk where he's describing his inside experience in Thai a good number of times. Something I want to say about why I have faith in Ajahn Anand's Dhamma. So I spent five range retreats with him in, I guess, what I would call the good old days because he had less disciples and he wasn't famous. And uh, in those days, massaging his shoulders, massaging his feet late at night and asking him any number of irritating questions which he was very patient answering and uh, it was really wonderful to have that close contact and uh, just the consistency of his answers but even more than that more than the warmth of the metta and the kindness that he showed what I find when I listen to the Dhamma of Ajahn Anand it's as if you can feel the emptiness when he speaks so much of what Tanajan speaks about is a method, a process, which is non-personal. And he constantly refers to Ajahn Chah and to the Buddha with gratitude. And you never hear him say a self-congratulatory comment. It's so modest and humble, it's stunningly so. And uh, he does have a great number of skills that he doesn't reveal to everybody, but those who know him a little more closely will know that he has pretty remarkable abilities in his meditation. But even more than that is that sense of when he's giving his Dhamma talk, he'll be talking about a process, and when he talks about his insight, he's basically saying, these are the factors that were present this is the experience that occurred and when this experience occurred this is what fell away from the mind and this is what then remained in the mind so it's very for me I really trust the uh, you can't find as far as I'm concerned any ego inflation there and you can't find any self-referential grandiose statements so I believe you know even in terms of reading it as a book we we can trust this monk's Dhamma. And so he trained with Ajahn Chah, who was his secretary. And uh, 
And then he went to practice with Tanajan Biak and Tanajan Dun to get more solitary time. But they had a very good foundation, quite close to Ajahn Chah as young monks. So anyway, I'll, I'll read first from the... Well, we last left off on this talk, Tanajan had just had a big insight, contemplating skin, seeing it as earth element, and then seeing the other body parts as earth element, and he explained that his mind entered a different stream of, of knowing without delusion. And so I'll read a little more from that talk. I'll just read the last two paragraphs where I left off to kind of jog people's memories. On the 28th of December, through the realization that the skin is a nichang, dukang, and an atta, the transformed heart also clearly saw the entire physical body in terms of these three characteristics. Just as seeing the skin alone with insight was enough to see deeply throughout the whole body because it is of the same nature, composed of the same fundamental elements. Whatever fundamental element is seen with clarity, then the entire physical body is also clearly perceived in this light and the defilements of greed, hatred and delusion steadily diminish. Following this, my confidence in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha greatly increased because I had seen for myself the truth taught by the Buddha that this body is anichang, dukang and anatta. I had enormous confidence in the Buddha as the teacher of the way, confidence in the truth of the Dhamma because I had realized it for myself, and faith in the Arya Sangha as being truly well practiced because my heart had also become steadfast in this way of training. Having realized this state, I understood why the scriptures say that the heart no longer falls into evil ways. The heart was steady and possessed of enormous faith, whatever the passing mood or mental state. Supposing someone was to tell me to kill an animal, saying, if you don't kill this creature, then I'll murder you. The mind would have already been made up. The heart would have already come to an agreement because it has clearly seen the body as anicca, dukkha and anatta. No longer will it permit the performance of unwholesome deeds or submit to acts of evil. The path that leads to the lower realms of torment and misery through the performance of evil, unskillful actions has been shut and sealed. How does it come to be shut and sealed? It is just this heart that seals itself off. It happens by itself because sealer enters and abides in the heart. Prior to December 28th, my practice of sealer was just an outward form, the use of precepts to discipline conduct in body and speech. And then on this day, the heart was transformed and the practice of sealer became an internal affair of the heart. The heart became disciplined inside, able to discriminate between right and wrong without the need for external precepts. For example, sometimes I would do something wrong, but with the mind calm and peaceful it would know that that act was unwholesome. The heart had attained to balance and security and so I was always on the right path, where evil is gradually and steadily abandoned. The Buddha explained that one who reaches this point will not be born again, or has reached a limit of only seven more births at most. On December 28, 1981, my heart plunged into the stream of Dhamma and realized the truth just as I have described here. At that moment, great confidence arose in my heart together with feelings of tremendous bliss and well-being. Following on from this, my meditation proceeded smoothly without obstacles and with a clear understanding of the path of practice. I had continued to strive in the investigation of the physical body, contemplating the skin in terms of its elemental properties. Through the power of samadhi focused on the body, I would cause these elements to disintegrate and vanish until the body was seen as anatta. Sometimes in the course of my meditation, weariness with the object of contemplation was set in, and so I would change my focus. For example, if I became bored contemplating the skin on the hands, then I would move to the chest or head or imagine the skin splattered with blood, making it disintegrate and vanish, revealing its selfless nature. I needed to have flexibility as a skillful means in my investigation. This, however, is an individual matter because each person is different. 
I would reflect that sometimes, when investigating the same meditation theme, the heart doesn't want to do the work. It becomes dull and boring, like eating just one type of food. When the heart became bored, I would have to be flexible, changing and adjusting my meditation so that the heart could see the body with insight as anatta. As my practice approached the month of September 1982, the heart began to find deep contentment through the development of the four Brahma Vihara. Quite simply, I loved cultivating loving kindness, compassion, appreciation, and equanimity. My experience of these divine abidings was different from before in that although the heart often dwelt in these states, they had not as yet become a firm or constant presence. As soon as I entered September of that year, however, the heart found deep satisfaction through the cultivation of these sublime emotions. Meanwhile, my investigation of the body continued with the contemplation of the blood. One point of practice that I had to make an effort to refine concerned being reserved and restrained in speech, in sleep, and in the senses. Lompo Cha would instruct us in the mode of practice that is never wrong, that is, restraining the senses from like and dislike, restraint from overindulgence in sleep by arousing energy, and restraint in the consumption of food. I tried hard to practice in this way, making an effort to restrain my speech. This is essential, because garrulousness leads the heart away from peace and causes samadhi to degenerate, and without samadhi, there is no insight. I continued to strive in the way described until the end of that year, 1982. At the beginning of the year 1983, I became more skilled in the practice of the Brahma Vihara. The investigation of the physical body, Kaya Sankara, continued with the skin as the main theme of meditation. I strove to investigate just this single theme back and forth, shifting and alternating between the skin of the feet, head, chest, hands, lips and face. I would investigate the repulsive aspects of the female body, focusing deep inside on the intestines, kidneys, liver and lungs. Whatever devices or techniques others may have employed in their meditation, those described here were the skillful means that I used in the course of my investigation into the physical body. So I might just comment here. When Antanajan is investigating the female body, it's not a gender bias issue. If it was a female practitioner who had lust for male forms, that female practitioner would be investigating the loathsomeness of the male body. So it's, uh, it's in context of addressing one's kilesa, depending on the direction that they, that they go. I had to put forth a consistent effort, not just fits and starts. I was convinced that there was nothing higher than unremitting effort relinquishing all in the attempt to find the time and opportunity to strive resolutely in practice. I tried to contemplate all external objects as anatta, not self, making them vanish away. Sometimes I would contemplate those things that I used to consider valuable, such as diamonds. When they disintegrate, diamonds are no different from earth. In the mind's eye, I would change them into earth, break them down into soil, and then see how this earth combined and compressed over time to form diamonds. I investigated strenuously to cut off attraction towards worldly things. Each time I contemplated the body, any attachment towards it would be removed from the heart along with the delight that accompanies clinging to this physical form. The power of greed, hatred and delusion was steadily undermined and weakened. The heart became absorbed in the practice, blissful, tranquil, and at ease. There were no feelings of weariness, only the need to practice for the sake of liberation. Sometimes, if I happened to see a beautiful woman, then in my mind's eye her body would become bloated and swollen, splitting apart until it disintegrated and was seen as not self in accordance with reality. As my practice entered June of 1983, close to the rains retreat, a desire to accelerate its efforts arose within the heart as though it longed to be finished with its work once and for all, and to go all out in practice. There was an urgency to accelerate my efforts and diminish the power of lust, anger and delusion in the heart. Consequently, I took leave of Ajahn Biek and Ajahn Dan and went to spend the rains retreat at Ban Mi. 
After several days at Ban Mi, as a village, I began to strive in earnest until one day the mind became very peaceful. As I sat and focused inwards in samadhi, the heart became calm and blissful. Then it passed beyond rapture, piety, and into the second jhana, an experience of deep serenity, bliss, and one-pointedness. The feeling of rapture was not the rapture of Rupajara samadhi, but the inner gladness of jhana without vitaka and vichara, accompanied with joy and happiness, born of samadhi. When the mind had withdrawn from this experience, I listened to a tape of Lompo Cha, teaching on the subject of existence and birth. Lompo pointed out that whatever we attach to will define our mode of existence and subsequent rebirth, which will, in turn, be a cause of suffering. At that time, I hadn't been performing the daily monastic duty of the morning and evening chanting. The heart had no desire to chant or recite. It only wanted to increase its efforts in meditation. However, while listening to Lompo Cha, I reflected that the reason my heart was squirming and feeling ill at ease at that moment was just because of this desire not to do any chanting. After reflecting in this way, the heart admitted to this truth and agreed to do the chanting. At that moment, it was as if something fell away or detached itself from the heart, giving rise to a deep rapture, the heart feeling light, free and unburdened. I felt completely immersed in bliss for the duration of that day. Around midnight or one in the morning, the mind was still wide awake, despite having not slept at all. The fruit that arose from my practice on that occasion still remains with me right up to today. The heart became calm and peaceful with the awareness that the practice had risen to another level of freedom. After June 20th, 1983, the heart began to feel relief from the defilements of lust, anger and delusion. In the period of practice between December 28th and June 20th, the heart became much more at ease than it had ever been before. The heart was deeply contented and carefree, and the practice was slowly and steadily improving, becoming easier and more thorough. At the end of October of that year, I was continuing with the contemplation of the body as elements. On one occasion, Instead of investigating the skin like before, the mind penetrated right through to the bones, seeing them disintegrate as anatta. Following on from this, I would repeatedly contemplate the body as an elemental experience of earth, air, fire and water, in a meticulous investigation of increasing refinement and profundity. The body was seen as elements disbanding and disintegrating, seen as not-self. After contemplation as Datu, elements, the body would separate out into its various elemental components, fine dust, a stream of water, eddies or bubbles of air, the swirling tongues of fire. As the investigation deepened from the coarse to the refined, these elements would in turn disband and disintegrate until the body was seen as mere atoms vanishing away completely, ending in not-self. So just much of that talk for today. And so it's uh, encouraging to see that the energy after this insight to practice harder and harder is there. The will to practice is simply there. And it's important to understand, and Arjuna Nam says it very clearly, matter-of-factly, that the more the mind sees the body as elements and it sees that it's not attractive, on one level we hear these words loathsome, on the idea of seeing something as a bloated corpse. We can't imagine that that's a pleasant experience. But what Tanajan is describing from his own experience is that when the mind sees the body as repulsive, destined to die and bloat and rot, or when he sees it as elements, the level of bliss and the degree to which the mind feels liberated is more and more pronounced. So that's an important thing to understand because body contemplation isn't talked about much in modern Buddhism and uh, it's one of the things about why I think Tanajan wanted to reveal the process of his enlightenment because for Ajahn Anand and for Ajahn Chah and also for Ajahn Man it seems this component of body contemplation was central. The consistency of the breath meditation the maintaining the awareness that came with Buddha and then the direct investigation of the physical body was 
linked very much to the insights that liberated them. So, I remember another occasion, this was when I was in Abhayagiri in America, our branch monastery in California. There's a monastery nearby called the City of Ten Thousand Buddhas. And I went to visit that monastery and pay respects actually to the relic of Su Yun and uh, Master Wa. And we met the abbot. And uh, so the City of Ten Thousand Buddhas has all these wonderful long pujas to the various bodhisattvas and buddhas and uh, very beautiful sounding. And so I went to pay respects to this monk and we wanted to bow. He's a very humble monk, quite young, and uh, but very gifted meditator. And so I wanted to pay respects, had faith in his practice, very radiant. And uh, he didn't want us to bow, but we insisted we wanted to bow to the abbot. And he said, okay, you can bow, but I'm going to bow at the same time. So as we were bowing to him, he bowed to us. It's very beautiful. And he had a picture of a skeleton. This is why I bring this up. He had a picture of a skeleton in his room, that we were in his private room. And he said, you know, these pujas, he said, the nuns, the nuns really like to chant it as beautifully as possible. And they really want to have visions. And uh, they want to have visions of heaven realms and visions of bodhisattvas. And he says, but what I do is I just kind of sit in meditation and what I see is that. And he pointed to the skeleton. And uh, it was just one of those occasions where you see a monk who's very radiant, very serene and uh, pleasant to be with. You can feel the kind of samadhi coming off of him. And he's also saying... Uh, and what he did was he got himself an auto because he had he had to ring the bell for the pujas. So he, after his preliminary chanting, he would then sit in meditation in the middle of the hall with the puja going on around him and the sitting going on. And he had a kind of an automatic bell so that he could just stay sitting because he liked to sit for a very long time. But it was it was interesting to see that in another tradition, uh, a monk whose practice I respected uh, was basically pointing to the same thing that uh, the, he was experiencing great peace and great bliss by holding in awareness the perception of the bones. So I, I thought I'd share that as well. I'm going to read a little more from Ajahn Anand's general talk, good advice, practice advice, about how we, who don't have quite as much barami as he had, uh, maybe some of us do, we don't realize it yet, but let's be optimistic. Anyway, we have some barami, we're here. He gave this talk to the gathering at Wapapong, and uh, it's very inspiring, but you'll hear his quality of faith and praise for the Buddha. Buddha means one who is awakened to the truth. After the Buddha's enlightenment, then due to the power of his great compassion, rather than dwelling alone in the bliss of liberation, he went forth with loving kindness to teach the multitude, beginning with Venerable Anya Kondanya the first of the Savaka Sangha. This realization and transmission of the Dhamma continues through our teacher and guide in the practice, Lumpo Cha, right into the present. I believe that if we diligently apply ourselves to his teachings, then peace and happiness will arise in our lives. Lay people should firmly establish their lives in virtue and goodness and try to cultivate mindfulness, samadhi, wisdom and samma ajiva, right livelihood. Whatever our work or duties, we should endeavor to perform them with mindfulness using a mantra, Buddha, Dhammo, or Sanko, to hold our attention. We have come together to practice Dhamma, and so whatever bodily movement or wholesome activity we engage in, we can meditate at the same time by focusing upon the mantra, Buddha, continuously. In this way, we can say that we are performing both external duties and the internal task of making the heart peaceful. When we strive to train our hearts continuously like this, then our humanity will be complete in both body and mind. We become Kalyana Jana, one whose heart is possessed of goodness and grace, like all of us gathered together here practicing the Dhamma. The heart of such a person aspires only to the arising of the wholesome merit that comes through the practice of Dhamma. For what purpose have we traveled here today, from towns and cities both near and far? We have come seeking Buddha, the knower. In other words, to realize this enlightened awareness and awaken our hearts like the Lord Buddha before us. In bringing forth this Buddha, or awakened awareness, 
Then there is Buddha on the level of Sila and Buddha on the level of generosity or Dana. We already know that there is abundant wealth in the world and that stinginess is blameworthy. If we don't use our wealth beneficially, then when we are gone it's worthless. Everyone is born and dies and nobody can take with them the assets they have amassed. Whether vast wealth or even this physical body, entirely everything must be left behind. If our assets are not used in wholesome and meritorious activities directed towards our spiritual welfare or the benefit of society as a whole, then they have scarcely any value. However, if we are heedful and possessed of Buddha, this awakened awareness, then according to our strength and ability, we can be generous, self-sacrificing and of service to others, whether to our country, our fellows in society or those experiencing accidents and misfortune. In this way we are giving and sharing our happiness with others. And this is how we perfect the virtues of dana and chaga, generosity and self-sacrifice. When these virtues of goodness and generosity become natural inclinations of the heart, we then train in making peace and tranquility our heart's natural abiding. Sometimes, however, while training the heart in peace, there will be restlessness, agitation and doubt. This is also natural. On occasions we may become frustrated. I'm a meditator. Why are greed, anger and delusion still present in the heart? It is natural, though, that because our heart is not yet Buddha, enlightened, it will be deluded by the power of ignorance, craving and attachment. Therefore, when we come to the practice of Dhamma, we have to abandon ignorance, craving and attachment. We must let go of delusion and cultivate wisdom, establishing the heart in Buddha, awakened awareness. When possessed of Buddha, the heart is not deluded. The undeluded heart is one possessed of wisdom, and the heart possessed of wisdom is free from suffering. The awareness that is Buddha begins with a heart that is happy, peaceful, and free from stinginess. The Lord Buddha's heart was completely established in Buddha. He further taught that if we aspire to a peaceful, radiant heart, or in other words, if we are determined to realize the genuine, original mind, the mind naturally possessed of purity and peace, then we must ardently meditate. Today we have such an opportunity to strive in meditation. We can use this occasion to listen to the teachings of the Kruba Ajans and senior monks from the various branch monasteries, who have traveled here today to recollect the kindness of Lumpo Cha, the teacher who enabled us to gain understanding in these very teachings, and who guided us in the same practice that we now undertake as an offering to his memory. As we practice in dedication to Lumpo Cha, we are cultivating that which is of benefit to us, higher wisdom and understanding. We have to put forth effort to train ourselves, developing patient endurance in both sitting and walking meditation. Why is it that we train ourselves? We train to realize the Dhamma. Our Kruba Ajahn Lumpo Cha told us how this realization of Dhamma did not come easily. Before his heart awakened to Buddha and he was able to teach and instruct his lay and ordained disciples, he experienced all kinds of obstacles, barely escaping with his life. We must focus on the mantra Buddha, establishing continuous awareness whether standing, walking, sitting, reclining, working, talking, drinking or thinking. Right now, while listening to the Dhamma, we can direct our minds to peace and not allow our attention to wander to other things. When the heart is peaceful, we can say that sila, samadhi and panya have arisen. We are able to understand the Dhamma as taught by the Lord Buddha, that this body is anichang, dukang and anatta. Anichang means impermanent, dukang means suffering, and anatta means without a self or soul. These physical forms that we call our substance or ourselves arise through a compounding of impersonal elements. The mind possessed by delusion, however, discriminates between these bodies believing this is me, this is you. All of us sitting here are identical in that we breathe, eat and drink. Therefore, we are all composed of the same fundamental elements, earth, air, fire and water. Why then do we cling to these elements, identifying with them as me and you? This attachment is because of delusion. 
The heart lacks wisdom and so delusion arises. In order to establish our heart in wisdom, we must have mindfulness and put forth effort to carefully restrain our actions of body, speech and mind in a way that gives rise to samadhi. In practicing this way, we are cultivating satipatthana, because this way of practice is within the framework of these four foundations of mindfulness. When developing satipatthana, do we begin by contemplating the body or feelings, the mind or mind objects? Lompo Cha would answer that we begin by developing the first foundation, the section called Kayagata, mindfulness focused on the body. It is essential that we mindfully consider our physical body. Why is this so? For the reason that this coarse physical form, a source of our clinging attachment, can easily be investigated. As for the other foundations of mindfulness beginning with feelings, their investigation proceeds from the contemplation of the body. Bodily feelings and mental feelings, for example, are related to each other. Sometimes we might investigate the body with mindfulness and wisdom, distinguishing between the various physical elements and immaterial aggregates, such as feelings and contemplating their arising and ceasing, until we realize that these feelings are merely mental processes, that are neither a self nor a soul, neither a person nor a being, and to be regarded as neither ours nor theirs. On those occasions when the heart has become empowered through the practice to a greater degree, we can gain insight into the state of the mind itself. Mind possessed by attraction or aversion, possessed by raga, dosa or moha, greed, hatred and delusion. Sometimes we are able to recognize the mind that is without these defilements of greed, hatred and delusion, when with mindfulness and wisdom, the heart recognizes these defilements together with attraction and aversion, then they pass away. This is an indication that on these occasions, the investigation is focused on the third foundation of mindfulness. However, this does not mean that we are able to contemplate at this level all the time, because the strength of our heart, the powers of samadhi and wisdom, eventually weaken, and we are unable to maintain the contemplation anymore. The investigation then falls back to the second foundation focused on feelings, which, in turn, further weakens and drops down to a lower level. Therefore, we must contemplate this body as the basic foundation of practice. In the initial stage of the training, we must try our absolute hardest in the caring for the mind, keeping it wholesome, firm and focused. We can look internally, what's our state of mind like? Is it wholesome or unwholesome? In what ways does the mind think and proliferate? Are these thoughts and mental formations just memories and fantasies? Whatever mental phenomena arise, we must observe and investigate them. If our inner strength is sufficient, when we contemplate these phenomena, wisdom will arise. When our inner strength weakens, then it is enough to investigate the body. This is the work we have to do. Striving in this way weakens clinging and attachment, brings forth wisdom, and strengthens our practice of the path. This way of practice can be called the path of power, or the fearless path through which the kilesa shrink away. However, we cannot cease in our efforts. Whenever we pause along the path, the kilesas take over from there. We must put forth effort to be carefully composed and consistent in our practice of the path. When our practice is steady all the time, then our heart will develop to a higher degree. If the heart is peaceful to a certain level while walking in meditation, then when coming to sit in samadhi, this calm and serenity will further deepen. When we maintain an even and continuous calm while sitting in meditation, then this tranquil abiding will develop and extend into all our normal everyday movements and activities, and the heart will experience even greater peace. The practice will progress to the level where, through investigation, the body is seen with insight as just four elements and as something loathsome and repulsive. The more the body is seen with insight as unattractive, the more the heart becomes beautiful and bright. The deeper the insight into the repulsiveness of the body, then the deeper the happiness that arises. And as this internal happiness increases, the more profound becomes the insight into not-self. The heart uproots clinging and attachment. It is as if it has entered another world. This experience can be called the comprehension or realization of the Dhamma.
I might leave that one there for now too. Ajananan giving us instruction, how he understands Ajahn Chah instructed as well, taking mindfulness as the body as the foundation of the practice. We we'll come back to our feelings of the breath, feelings of the footsteps, and he's explaining that when the clarity in the mind is more powerful and very steady, then we naturally see the three characteristics in the other foundations of mindfulness. But to take investigating the mind as the main uh, mode of practice is dangerous because basically the mind is only strong enough to do it sometimes. But if you take mindfulness of the body as the general practice, the body is always there. You can always come back to that practice. So this was how he says Ajahn Chah stressed. Body awareness, consistent body awareness, lots of walking meditation, lots of sitting meditation. And then when the mind has the energy and the clarity to investigate the feelings, the uh, more subtle mental phenomena. I always find it very beautiful to notice the tone with which Ajahn Anand speaks of Lumpur Cha and uh, gives him a great deal of credit and uh, basically acknowledging that uh, his own insight was dependent upon the clear instruction and example of Lumpur Cha. And Lumpur Cha would say the same thing about Lumpur Man. So uh, this beautiful lineage, uh, living enlightened lineage. So I'm happy to share that with you all today on uh, day six of our retreat. We have a couple of days left. I thought it would be good to, uh, you know, as the days deepen and people's minds get more peaceful, to uh, have a look at these more profound dhammas and coming back, of course, to the foundation upon which the profound dhammas are realized. So we're doing these practices, these very practices that will liberate you. It's just a matter of consistency, and we don't know exactly when big insights occur, but we can have small insights. And we don't know when the amazing samadhi arises, but we can have some samadhi. But it's good to feel confident. This is uh, Samma Patipada, right practice, cultivating the Eightfold Path in this uh, lineage, which has, uh, even in this day, realized masters. So I'd like to lead a guided meditation with a bit of body contemplation, if people... Can you tolerate the sitting posture a bit longer? Okay. Probably just uh, 25 minutes. Just while we're, you know, when the mind has receptivity and faith, sees the context for a practice, it's good to do some of that practice, lay some imprints. Just remembering another, I was very fortunate to have a, a good opportunity as a novice monk 18 years ago, what we've been talking about. Ajahn Chandiko, who's abbot of a monastery in New Zealand, used to lead groups of monks from Wat Chat to pay respects to monks that he had heard were very well practiced. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to go as a novice and we paid respects to Lumpur Ban and Ajahn Mahabua, uh, Lumpur Utai. But one place we went was a fairly remote forest in a small, actually it used to be a remote forest, but it was a small old growth forest surrounded by fields, but it was far away from any big towns. And if I remember his name properly, the monk that we were paying respects to, his name was Lumpur Kamdun. Anyway, he was a disciple of Lumpur Mahabua, and uh, when we paid respects to him, he was 95, I think. He'd lived in that monastery for 40 years, and I think that was the monastery where it's believed he attained to Arahantship. We were chatting with him, and he spoke a difficult-to-understand Lao dialect, but we did understand uh, some of what he was saying. It's hard to describe this 95-year-old, very, very thin monk. And he had eyes, I'm not joking, like diamonds. And you walk into this room, there was this still, just very palpable clarity. You could hear everything. 
very, very special feeling in this monastery and in this in this uh, room. So Lumpur Kamdun, he'd had a Western monk staying there at some point, and they were talking. And apparently, the uh, Western monk was explaining because he'd only ever been in the village, northeast Thailand. So he was asking questions about other places, and he was like. Wasn't sure if the North Pole and the South Pole really uh, were ice. Is it true that there's whole continents that are covered in ice? Is kind of asking the Western monk. So what happened was uh, one of the attendants came in to attend Lumpur and noticed that his hands had red blisters all over them. And said, "Lumpur, what happened?" And he's like, "Well, I went to see." If the North Pole really was ice, and apparently he'd come back with frostbite, <laughs> well, he went and had a look, and he touched the ice. He came back, and uh, so this monk was not an ordinary monk. Another time he went to New York. Apparently, he was saying, "You know, it's amazing. They live like ants." There's these big houses that are piled layer upon layer upon layer, and then like crawling around in these things like ants. It's just like an ant's nest. So he described big city. Anyway, he was chewing his betel nut and his red lips, spitting, but his eyes like diamonds. And he also had a picture. So why I mention this? He had a picture of a skeleton in his room. I can't remember if it was a picture or if it was a skeleton, actually. But anyway, because there's often a, a real skeleton in forest monasteries for the monks to contemplate. His dhamma was simple. He just said to us, "You know, you have to practice because you have to practice because you're born, you're born, you're born, you're born, you're born, and then you die and die and die and die and die. You're born and you die and you're born and you die and you're born and you die." And he said. When you guys come in here, you know what I see? I'm like, what? He said, I see bones. <laughs> Now, if he wasn't in line, you think he was mad. But when they burned his body, it's full of relics. And uh, you know, he came back from the North Pole with frostbite. So, just once again, it's nice to tell you these stories because if you read, you read this dhamma, it's like I have to see the body as loathsome. I have to think about bones. It's the mind doesn't want to. And you have to believe these practitioners when they say the more you see the body as loathsome, the more beautiful the mind becomes. The more you see it as repulsive, the more bliss and rapture and liberation your mind feels. So, in some respects, it's quite a high practice to be talking about with lay people, but. Many of you are in your fifties, so sexual lust is fading a bit. <laughs> the reason I mention it, though, is because when I gave a little questionnaire and I asked how many of you sincerely aspire to be s o d a p a n a s most of you said you do. So you asked for it. <laughs> Next, I'm going to bring a skeleton. We all have one, though, don't we? There's forty skeletons in the room. Where are the skeletons? Ah. Okay, close your eyes. <laughs>